This is a Media Lab podcast. Welcome to Putting It Together, the podcast that goes through the entire body of work of Stephen Sondheim, show by show and song by song. My name is Kyle Marshall, your self-described Sondheim expert. You know, there's a crispness in the air, and soon it'll be the season of witches and bloody barbers, but we're not quite there yet. We're still discussing the horror of growing older and being in toxic relationships, or what I like to call election season. We're talking about Follies, and we have David Heinemann who has returned. You can check out David's last appearance all the way back in our Anyone Can Whistle season, where he discussed Simple. There'll be a link to that in the show notes. I do need to give a huge thank you to the continued support I receive from my Patreon subscribers. Thank you so much for helping out the show. We have fun discussions over there, bonus pieces of audio, and depending on the tier that you're supporting at, a video where I answer some of your more pressing questions. Like this month, where I answered that if I could do a show just like this with another composer, who would I pick? So thank you to the God That's Good tier. I thank these people each and every week. The Holy Triumvirate is still rocking. Jack, Todd, and Barry, thank you so much. And now it's time for Plotting Along. Plotting Along is a part of the show where I help describe to you what is happening in the plot. So we are truly inside of the Psycho Follies. Each core character has a chance to have their solo. Up first is Buddy, whose inner turmoil is that he's in two relationships and isn't fulfilled with Margie or Sally. The even bigger horror is that neither woman is fulfilled either. All right, I'm going to go thank some sponsors, and then when I return, it will be my conversation with David Heinemann about the song Buddy's Blues. Putting It Together is a proud member of the Alberta Podcast Network, locally grown, community supported. The Alberta Podcast Network promotes and supports Alberta-made podcasts and connects their audiences with Alberta-based businesses and organizations. This episode of Putting It Together is brought to you by the inaugural YEG PodFest, that's Y-E-G PodFest, presented by Edmonton Community Foundation in partnership with the Alberta Podcast Network and LitFest, Canada's non-fiction festival. Running October 1st through 3rd, the festival will be held entirely online this year, so anyone can experience it. Events will include master classes with experts. I'm going to pause the podcast here and tell you that that is going to be me. I'm going to be actually on a panel this year discussing a little bit about how to use podcasting in your business. More on that in future weeks. So events will include master classes with experts, panel discussions, feature interviews, and more. Some of APN's podcasters will be part of these events, again, that is me, with guests from around the world. To find out more, head to yegpodfest.ca and sign up to receive updates. This episode of Putting It Together is also brought to you by CPA Alberta. CPA Alberta represents more than 29,000 CPAs, also known as Chartered Professional Accountants, across the province. CPAs are more than number crunchers who love Excel spreadsheets. They are business leaders, finance experts, trusted advisors, and entrepreneurs. They work in many different industries, from film to fashion, from government to oil and gas. Long story short, CPAs didn't just break the mold, they made it their own feel like that's a Smash Mouth song. Anyways, CPAs can help you spark your next big idea, pivot during these difficult times, start your new business off on the right foot, and so much more. For an inside look at how Alberta CPAs are supporting their clients through the pandemic, follow CPA Alberta on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn. You can also visit cpaalberta.ca to find out more. Folks, we're into the follies. First, though, folks, we'll pause for a mo. No, no, folks, you'll still get your jollies. It's just I got a problem that I think you should know. David Heineman, thank you so much for coming back. Well, thanks for having me. You know, because you've been here before, I want to jump like right into it. I want to know what your first interaction with follies is. So my first time seeing this show was uh, a production at the Chicago Shakespeare Theater in 
I think 2011, my wife and I went and saw the show and it was this incredible production. Being at the theater, being at a, at a place like that, it's tends to be an older audience, 60s, 70 year old audiences. We were mm-hmm. in our early 30s and I thought, well, this is as the show is going on. I mean, I knew what the show was about, but I'd never seen it. And I thought, oh, here's this show about young people who are just getting married and feel like their whole life is ahead of them and everything will be great. And 30 years later, nope, their lives are pretty miserable. And as we're getting in the car uh, at the end of the show, I thought, this is going to be a very quiet car ride home, isn't this? <laughs> There's just a lot to think about. This is heavy yeah. stuff. Um, so that was that was my first interaction with it. And then last year, I got to be, a, I was in a local production of of Follies as young Ben. Oh, nice. That's great. That's great. I have to say something that you just brought up. Um, which I think is so relevant to Folly specifically. It's it's kind of um not necessarily like a criticism, I guess, that that's made, but it's certainly something that's said about Sondheim, which you, you do kind of need to like see many of his shows to really understand what's going on. And with Follies, even though I had like dipped into the score a little bit, it really wasn't until like this past year of me really digging into it a little bit deeper where I really started to get a great appreciation for the show. I watched a version of it uh, because if you just listen to the score, I think you might have a very different interpretation of how and what this show is about. And when you finally see it, it's like, oh, this is devastating <laughs> to to watch all the way through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and especially with a score like this, where there's really two scores, mm-hmm. right? There's the, there's the pastiche numbers and then there's the book numbers and without seeing them together, it, understanding how they interact with each other and how they're commenting on each other, I think, can be pretty tricky. What do you think you learned about Follies by being in the show? One of the things that that I learned over the course of the show was how I gained a real appreciation for the book itself, um, that I think there's so much that's written in there. It's not explicit right away or it's, you know, it's sort of hidden and the, that you can unpack it a little bit like when Buddy first arrives or when he first sees, uh, when he first arrives at the the party, he's asking around, my wife, have you seen her? She took the early flight. Mm-hmm. And then he does see Sally and she says, oh, buddy, you came. Clearly, right. She didn't just take the early flight and he was going in later after work or whatever. She wasn't supposed to go, but they'd had a fight and right. she got on a plane and flew to New York. And that that's never totally explicit, but it, it sort of as the story goes on, it, it unravels a little bit. And I feel like being in the show and being there day after day, you you start to see like, oh, there's so much that's be, that's unsaid here that is just really well crafted to develop these characters. And you really these are really fully fleshed people. How many performances was that that you were in? So it was, uh, it ran for just a, a two weeks. Uh, I just asked that cause I'm, I'm for something that wasn't just like a night or something like that. Mm-hmm. What was the oddest audience response that you had? One of my wife's friends came to the show and my wife had explained to her ahead of time a little bit about the premise. It's these four characters <laughs> and their four younger selves. And I think at intermission, the friend turned to her and said, I'm so glad you explained that to me because I had no idea what was going on. I thought, <laughs> okay, well, th- that was a good, good, helpful note then. That's right. Once you get that conceit, the show makes a fair amount of sense. But yeah. if you don't get that this Ben and that Ben are the same, this Sally and that Sally are the same, that's that's confusing, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, today we're going to be delving into the song that's called by kind of two different names on the original Broadway cast, the official name. And actually, according to Sondheim's book, the official name to this song is the God, why don't you love me blues? Although a lot of other versions just call it buddies blues, which is certainly easier to say. (laughs) Um, And actually, weirdly enough, we're recording this just like not even a full week after the 90th birthday Sondheim celebration that happened this past weekend. There was a, rendition of this song and they refer to it as buddy's blues so maybe that's like the new official way that you're supposed to reference this song regardless i do want to give credit to the performers who have performed this so in the versions that we're concerning ourselves with this season buddy was portrayed by gene nelson in the original broadway cast by david healy in the 1987 london version and then by peter forbes in the 2017 national theater version 
Now, we have been discussing a lot here this season, David, about pastiche. I don't know, how much of this song do you understand what it's in reference to? Or did you delve much into this song uh, before today? I think a, a little bit, you know, some of those some of those earlier numbers that Sondheim's referencing. I think that's something that's so impressive to me about about this show and about how he put this score together is that not only is he doing sort of these old time songs or, you know, referencing them, but he's Mm -hmm. referencing specific songs for specific characters or, you know, that this character will have an earlier sort of number. You know, this, this character is really more of like 1910s, this character singing more from the 1920s. And so I want to use that, that, that to me was such an impressive thing that he's doing. I'm going to sound a bit like a broken record uh, for the people who've been listening to the entire season, but the thing that continually blows my mind if you delve into Sondheim's book is that oftentimes, too, he's not just referencing a certain composer. It's like, I'm using this uh, composer's music and then this lyricist's lyrics and then kind of combining them together. And like that is just a whole other level of complexity that I would never honestly in a million years pick up on but it's like Mm -hmm. he very intentionally was doing it this way in sondheim's book finishing the hat he references kind of three different composers that he is kind of referencing in this song so the first and kind of i would say most obvious one is that the music in this is very reminiscent of ira and george gershwin Mm -hmm. and in particular there's a song called the half of it deary blues which if you do listen to it which we're about to uh, you can really pick up some very big similarities of how this song is structured. Uh, so to kind of give you an understanding of where this is coming from, this is a portion of that song performed by Danny Gardner and Aaron Mackey. I've got the you don't know the half of it, dearie blues. The trouble is you have so many from whom to choose. If you should marry Tom, Dick, or Harry, life would be the bunk. I'd become a monk. I've got the you don't know the half of it, dearie blues. All right, so that's the music that Sondheim is emulating. And then there's two lyricists that he's kind of using. Uh, So to a lesser extent... Sondheim is trying to be Lauren's heart here. Well, of course, Rogers and Hart was fairly famous before uh, Rogers and Hammerstein were. So this was like his first partner that he had. Uh, and he calls out specifically, I wish I were in love again. Uh, so to understand how what those lyrics sound like, here's a song. Sorry, here's that song from the movie Words and Music, even though the song was first written for Babes in Arms. And it's performed by Judy Garland and Mickey Rooney. You don't know how much we're born. The sleepless nights, the daily fights, the quick to bark and when you reach the heights. I miss the kisses and I miss the fights. I wish I were in love again. The broken dates, the endless waits, the lovely loving and the hateful hates, the conversation with the flying plates. I wish I were in love again. No more pain. No more strain. Now I'm saying, but I would rather be God, God. So David, to make things even more complex. So as I said, uh, he was trying to use Lauren's heart a little bit, but he says more than that, he's actually trying to use Frank Lesser, which uh, he says, yes, wasn't really writing during the Follies, but this is a dream sequence. So I had a little bit of fun with it. So um, it's a combination of Lauren's heart, Frank Lesser. And he said specifically the thing he was looking at was Adelaide's lament, which is from guys and dolls. So I'm picking the film version of that sung by Vivian Blaine. A a person could develop a cold. You could spray her wherever you figure the streptococ I like. You can give her a shot for whatever she's got, but it just won't work if she's tired of getting that fish eye from the hotel clerk. A person can develop a cold. So we have that backstory here now. Um, I, I should just ask, David, before I blow past it, are you familiar with any of those 
uh, performances or those songs? I I hadn't been. No, not before this. Uh, I guess uh, Adelaide's Lament from Guys and Dolls, I, I knew, but mm-hmm. I would not have thought, oh, this is very much like this uh, unless it was yeah. pointed out to me. This is uh, the amazing thing. Like when you get like super nerdy or super involved in a certain aspect, like when you can call up like, of course, this is like this 1920 song sung by this person. It's like, I'm sure it is. I just do not have that deep knowledge to say if you're right or wrong. Yeah. And I, I wonder, too, you know, if if he hadn't done that or if he had, you know, mixed eras in a way that wasn't mm-hmm. uh, as appropriate, would anybody notice? Would it feel different right. you know, or does yeah. it? just work better subconsciously because because those fit the era so well that's a great question to ask like i love the fact that he went this far into his like research and and really tried to emulate those things i think what it recalls a little bit is that for Steintheim, he wrote that it's it's more important for them to sound like you think the follies sounded like rather than mm-hmm. them actually being a folly song mm-hmm. i think that's so true it's like yeah this sounds like the follies even though it probably doesn't like to a T sound like the Follies, but it sounds like what you would imagine it should sound like. So that again, is like third, like 3d level chess that I'm, <laughs> <laughs> it's hard for me to grasp onto. Exactly. Um, but here is how buddy's blues starts. So buddy comes out and he states, hello folks. We're into the Follies. First though, folks we will pause for a mo. No, no folks. We'll still get your jollies. It's just, I got a problem that I think you should know. See, I've been very perturbed of late, very upset, very betwixt and between. The things that I want, I don't seem to get. The things that I get, you know what I mean. Hello, folks. We're into the follies. First, oh, folks. We'll pause for a mo. No, no, folks. You still get your jollies. It's just I got a problem that I think you should know. See, I've been very perturbed of late, very upset, very betwixt and between. The things that I want, I don't seem to get. The things that I get, you know what I mean? From that first section, David, is there anything that you want to call out? Well, the the first thing I think that's worth pointing out here is because this is the first of the four Follies numbers, each of the principles is going to get a Follies number here. Mm -hmm. They've just done Love Land and Love Will See Us Through and You're Going to Love Tomorrow. But the audience may not know that we're sort of shifting gears into this dream sequence or what what Sondheim calls a psycho follies. Um, And so that those first lines, hello, folks, we're into the follies, I think is is really important um, and can be really tricky because with a lot of uh, Sondheim songs, I think it's not till the second or third or 12th listen that you really get all the nuances. And it's a fast song. It's a patter song. And so that first line of we're into the follies there's something different going on here than what was going on before is really important i think that's especially true as the show has gone on that in 1971 some of the audience in broadway might have remembered Siegfeld's follies or their parents would they would be familiar with funny girl which had just come out what seven years earlier on broadway and a couple of, you know and then there'd been the movie version with Barbara Streisand and she's a Ziegfeld girl. So that idea of the vaudeville number or a torch song or the follies would be fairly familiar to them in a way that it's not to a 21st century audience. And so I think that that first line is, is really important in drawing us in and contextualizing what's going on. Yeah, I agree. I think that uh, we shouldn't just brush aside to the context in which this show was written in. Cause I think that a 1971 audience is going to have a very different interpretation of this versus like a 2020 audience Uh, for that very specific reason. I think Sondheim has talked about this definitely in some of the biographies of the making of Follies uh, talks about this too. A lot of reviews that were negative about Follies when it came out was, were kind of like that was kind of a pushback. Like, like this was like the, the heyday of, of Broadway. How can you be so dismissive of it? And yet like, I think they say it was so pressing because in like five or six years, yeah, like all of those old theaters were gone. Like we weren't mm-hmm. doing any of those types of reviews anymore. And Broadway specifically is a very, very different place. So it's one of those uh, shows that's almost like it uh, was almost a bit too soon because <laughs> it predicted mm-hmm. a lot of things that were about to about to happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. If you look at Broadway in the, the late 70s, it's a very different place than it was in the late 60s. 
And this show is is foretelling that in a lot of ways. There's some word choices too that I just wanted to bring out here. Of course, there's mm-hmm. like let's we'll pause for a mo, you know, short for a moment, and then no no is like right after that. So it's like mm-hmm. <laughs> there's three syllables that are that run nicely together. And of course, there's like um, very betwixt and between. Uh, yeah, it's very saw and timey. Like <laughs> definitely playing a lot with language here in this first little bit as well. Yeah, and I think those those to me at least feel very old timey. You know, I don't, Mm -hmm. most people don't talk about betwixt and between or getting your jollies. And I think that language helps set us in in an earlier time as well, you know, sort of putting us back in that, it, you know, like you were saying before, it might not actually be how they talked in vaudeville or in the follies, Mm -hmm. but it feels like how they talked in vaudeville and the follies. Like, I bet that's how they talked. For for whatever reason, it just makes me think of Pal Joey of uh, Bewitched, Bothered, and Bewildered. Just mm-hmm. those those bees and stuff together, which is again a bit of an older show too. So uh, we we kind of move on into a very kind of into like the the meat of what uh, Buddy is singing about here. This is when he gets like super fast. So the audience that are, is listening, I absolutely did this in the first take, and no editing uh, happened. <laughs> he goes. I've got those guy. Why don't you love me? Oh, you do. I'll see you later. Blues that long as you ignore me, you're the only thing that matters feeling that if I'm good enough for you, you're not good enough. And thank you for the present. But what's wrong with it stuff? Those don't come any closer because you know how much I love you feelings. Those tell me that you love me. Oh, you did. I got to run now. Blues. I got those. God, why don't you love me? Oh, you do. I'll see you later. Blues. Long as you ignore me, you're the only thing that matters. Feeling that if I'm good enough for you, you're not good enough. And thank you for the present, but what's wrong with it? Stuff those don't come any closer, cause you know how much I love you. Feelings those tell me that you love me. Oh, you did. I gotta run now, blues. Here's the big question I have for you, David. Honestly, just this section that we just read through. Who do you think Buddy is talking about? Because I have I've seen some different interpretations of what people think. So who do you think are, are, is actually saying those sentences that he's so blue about? So I think a lot of it in this section is is about Margie. There's a little bit of Sally there of long as you ignore me, you're the only thing that matters. I think describes his relationship with Sally pretty nicely. But I think a lot of this is is Margie. If I'm good enough for you, you're not good enough. Thank you for the present, but what's wrong with it stuff. But then I also feel like there's a little bit of, you know, we're getting a lot of his in interior world here. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think some of it is is himself. Even even just that first line, God, why don't you love me? Oh, you do, I'll see you later. There's he's struggling with loving himself, certainly, and feeling estranged from himself. That the things that seem to bring him joy being with margie uh, for example don't really bring him the joy that they might um and the things that uh, from an outside perspective should make him feel terrible you know being always seen as second best by his wife that's not enough to drive him away that he's still sticking with her um and so there's i think some self-alienation um going on yeah this is kind of where i'm coming down on it too after having been listening to this song on repeat over the last few days <laughs> which is i honestly think that when i first listened to this song it was like oh he's talking about like one person in particular i think that's giving him all of these emotions but i think he's bouncing around i think that there mm-hmm. is sally there is margie and there's himself as well i mean the one that i absolutely identify with is the one you just talked about that very first one the god why don't you love me oh you do i'll see you later it's one of those like <laughs> this is uh, my own craziness and uh of like oh you're showing romantic feelings to me well i don't trust anyone who would like me like that so goodbye you know it's mm-hmm. like one of those eccentricities that like you can't necessarily define unless you uh go and get some therapy which is always beneficial yeah this is a guy who would have benefited from living in the 21st century where some uh, where some therapy wouldn't have been quite so stigmatized mm-hmm I think, yeah, that definitely that sense of, you know, was the Will Rogers quote, I wouldn't want to be a part of any group that would accept me as a member. Right. Yeah. Um, (laughs) You know, that it just, if I'm good enough for you, uh, then you're, you're not good enough, right? That Mm -hmm. you've got to have, I I would want somebody with higher standards than someone who would accept me. How do you like the music that's playing underneath what is being sung here in this case? Because 
uh, of, of all of the follies numbers, these psycho follies numbers, this is the one that feels very vaudevillian to me. Mm-hmm. I could like honestly imagine like Groucho Marx or someone singing this song. So mm-hmm. I don't know. How, I don't know how you would uh, characterize the, the music that's being played. It's definitely, yeah, it definitely communicates vaudeville musically. And I think it, it does a nice job of reinforcing that sense of alienation of here's this incredibly sad number that he's singing. And if you put this to a sad tune, it would feel, I think, very appropriate and could be a real, <laughs> real weeper. Um, but it isn't. It's a, it's a, it, you know, draw, pulls down the house. It, it gets lots of laughs because I think partly because of the music and that, that disconnection between what we're hearing musically and what we're hearing textually, I think matches a little bit of what Buddy is doing of he's being torn between these two women, one of whom loves him and he's somewhat indifferent to, and the other who doesn't love him and he adores, um, and, and torn even within himself of how much should I value myself? How, uh, how worthwhile am I? Um, and so that, that pull between what the music says and what the words say, I think helps, helps support that idea. This is like one of those examples it, that was big on the internet years ago. I don't think it's as um, popular anymore about like slowing songs down by 500% and making <laughs> everything sad. You mm-hmm. can do that for this song. Definitely. I'm sure it would work very, very nicely. So the next section that comes out is very different, which is the, uh, how it's written is that like a chorus girl kind of comes from the wings and is portraying like the the Margie that Buddy is singing to, but it's not actually Margie that he's singing to. So uh, just imagine that we're I'm singing back and forth between two characters here. So Buddy says, Margie, oh Margie, she says she really loves me. I love you. She says she really cares. I care. I care. She says that I'm her hero, my hero. She says, I'm perfect, she swears. You're perfect, goddammit. She says that if we parted, if we parted, she says she says that she'd be sick. Blech. She says she's mine forever, forever. She says I gotta get out of here quick. And then Mardi will say in the background sometimes, don't go, I love you. She says she really loves me. I love you. She says, she says she really cares. I care, I care. She says that I'm her hero. My hero. She says, I'm perfect, she swears. You're perfect, goddammit. She says that if we parted, if we parted, she says, she says that she'll be sick. Yeah. She says she's mine forever. Forever. She says, I gotta get out of here quick. Um, so this is a very different section. Like the music changes, the pattern's a little bit different. How do you interpret like this like mini play that happens in the middle of the song? Yeah, I think we're we're seeing inside how he's imagining Margie um, and how he sees her seeing him. So we're getting sort of multiple layers in that. Uh, I feel like the, the meat of it, the is, is sort of him singing to us. And then we've got this break of, as you said, sort of this mini play of between buddy and Margie. And this part I think is, is really where we get the the sense of the laughs, you know, um, the uh, I'm perfect. She swears you're perfect. God damn it is 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 a great line um, and a really good use of that. The echo you know, that we've gotten two or three echoes at that point, And we're starting to pick up what this pattern is. And then she swears playing on she vows versus she's using foul language. I also think that it's this interesting counterpoint to a song that happens earlier in the show like the right girl is the other mm-hmm. buddy solo song right and then there you only hear about margie there's not usually a, an actress that comes out and portrays the margie character on stage mm-hmm. and uh, the conversation i had because i've recorded that episode already is that uh, at least one ma- major interpretation of it is Buddy has a very different interpretation of what is actually going on in that relationship than was actually going on in that relationship. Because you might think, oh, the right girl, like he wants to be with Margie and like that is the right girl for him. When when really I don't think either Sally or Margie necessarily want him long term. One is there because of convenience and, and, and one is there because of opportunity. Like I... I I don't know how you read that or if you have a different interpretation. Yeah, it's definitely very different from the right girl. And 
and even when he's in the in the show when he's talking about Margie to Sally, it seems like it's such a, a being at Margie's is such a place of respite for him mm-hmm. of you know we just sit and it's quiet and nice and she sews my buttons and it's just it's just nice there and he's stuck with Sally and Sally's not the right girl and i think you get a, i think you can very easily get a sense from that song and that scene of Margie would be the right girl but buddy is buddy is stuck with Sally and buddy mm-hmm. still also loves Sally um but this this time you get a, a different sense of Margie uh, or Buddy's relationship with Margie of uh, she's his forever. I got to get out of here quick that, you know, does he maybe not love Margie the way that we think he does or the the way that that earlier song seems to imply? Well, and not only that, but it's like the, the call and response that's happening here. I always get the impression that Margie is being sarcastic when she's saying these things back and forth and any of the interpretations any of the versions of this song that we're talking about it always comes across that way to me at least Mm -hmm. in my ear so again it's hard to necessarily uh pinpoint exactly because this is uh something that's going on in buddy's mind this is not actually margie that he's interacting with so could this be Buddy's interpretation of what margie is actually like or is this actually the real margie uh, that buddy has this like amazing interpretation of but in actuality, uh, she's kind of just in this relationship because he gives her things. Like, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of reading I'm putting into that. But I think there's ways that you can look at this in different ways. Yeah. Well, and we, we know from the rest of this song that he clearly uh, struggles with his own self-image. And, you know, that maybe in his mind, if Margie really likes him this much, maybe she... Or she says she likes him this much. She can't really mean that. So maybe she is being sarcastic. He's imagining her sarcasm uh, or demeaning her in some way because she does say she likes him. And so she must not be very worthwhile herself. Uh, Now, another thing I do need to point out here is that on the original Broadway cast, they really cut up this song uh, in a weird way because they had to fit it onto the one LP Mm -hmm. um, that... They basically cut out the entire end section of this song. And because they do that, then there's not a really great closer on this song. So what they've done is basically repositioned certain sections. So this last section that we just read through and the previous one in the original Broadway cast are actually flipped around. So you get the scene with this uh, Margie character and by the and then it goes back to what we read before like i've got those god god why don't you love me oh you do i'll see you later blues um which i think a little bit changes who he's talking about because it seems like now that section is a direct response to his interaction that he just had with margie rather than in the other two versions where he's talking about these nebulous things and then we go into this scene so it's a slight change but i think it does have a bigger impact than what you might think on first glance i think that's i think that's exactly right yeah it definitely flips flips around what's what seems to be commenting on what now uh of course they also flip the next two sections we're going to go through but here's uh section number one so buddy comes back and says i've got those whisper how i'm better than i think but what do you know blues that why do you keep telling me i stink when i adore you feeling that Say I'm all the world to you, you're out of your mind. I know there's someone else and I could kiss your behind. Those, you say I'm terrific, but your taste was always rotten feelings. Those, go away, I need you. Come to me, I'll kill you. Darling, I'll do anything to keep you with me till you. Tell me that you love me. Oh, you did, now beat it, will you? Blues. I've got those whisper how I'm better than I think, but what do you know, blues? That why do you keep telling me I stink when I adore you feelings? That say I'm all the world to you, you're out of your mind. I know there's someone else and I could kiss you behind. Those you say I'm terrific, but your taste was always rotten. Feelings. Those go away, I need you. Come to me, I'll kill you. Darling, I'll do anything to keep me with you till you. Tell me that you love me, oh, you did not mean it, will you? 
I really want to uh, jump into some of these run-on sentences that we get here. I always love, by the way, most of the performers do this, but when he goes into that, I've got those whisper how I'm better. Like he actually is almost whispering Mm -hmm. (laughs) those lyrics. So it's a nice like example of them mimicking what the actual lyrics are. But are there any of these like run-ons that you uh, like the most? There's two that stand out to me. One is is near the end of that section, the come to me, I'll kill you, darling, I'll do anything to keep you with me till you, because it's, I like that they're, you know, we've got the rhyme of kill you till you, but they are, we've added beats in between, which sort of fits with that pattern and with the, the harried nature of his thinking, I think. And it also, there's this odd asymmetry of, instead of it being verb subject, kill you, um, it's now till you and till isn't doing the verb you know isn't doing the action in that line so it's 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 rhyming but it's not really paralleling the previous line which i think is just just linguistically is interesting but then also can reinforce this idea of sort of how scattershot his thinking is right now Mm -hmm. um so i like that and then the just the ways that he definitely seems to be flipping back and forth here um between margie and sally you know sam all the world to you you're out of your mind i know there's someone else and i could kiss you behind those are clearly not meant for the same woman those two lines but they're stuck right next to each other yeah i I have the same kind of reading here because all these cannot be the same person Mm -hmm. Um, unless i guess your argument is that the he is with someone who is completely bipolar um because it's like whisper how i'm better than i think but what do you know like that's very much an internalized like you tell me I'm good, but I know I'm actually not like that. That's an mm-hmm. internalized uh, mantra that he's saying to himself. I, I also really love the you say that I'm terrific, but your taste was always rotten. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like that is definitely uh, like, I don't know if that is a Margie or a Sally <laughs> reference that he's throwing at them. But mm-hmm. that's uh, I like that turn of phrase. Like you say, I'm great, but I know that you have a traditionally t- terrible taste. So. <laughs> yeah yeah you you have no you have no taste in men so whoever you like that can't be right so we then segue into another kind of like mini play that happens here this time with a fictional sally because again another chorus girl is kind of walking into the frame here and uh buddy says and this will be a call and response here again but it starts off with buddy going sally oh sally uh she says she loves another another she says a fella she prefers furs furs she says that he's her idol 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 she says ideal she avers you deal avers you say that anybody buddy blah she says would suit her more than i i i i she says that i'm a washout a washout she says i love her so much i could die and then sally will say get out of here oh sally she says she loves another. Another. She says a fella she prefers. Fours. Fours. She says that he's her idol. I lie, 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 She lie. says ideal she avers. You deal? The verse? She says that anybody. Body. She says Wah. would suit her more than I. Ay, ay, ay. She says that I'm a washout. A wash. She says, I love her so much I could die. Get out of here! So just at the top here, there is a bit of a lyric change in this section from the 1987 London version. So the small section where it's like, she says, a fella she prefers, and then Sally says, furs, furs. Um, basically up until the Idol, Idol, Idol song, it, it actually goes back and forth like this. She says she loves another. She claims that I am a jinx. She cries that she adores him. She says he's perfect, she thinks. You don't get that idle section there at all. She says she loves another. Another. She says and claims that I'm a jinx. <laughs> she cries that she adores him. He adores him. She says he's perfect, she thinks. He's perfect. Um, that being said, I would love to know what your interpretation of this like mini scene is, David. So one of the things that that comes across here is I think Sally Sally doesn't come across looking great here. No. <laughs> um not only in the fact that she's with another guy while married to Buddy, but she comes across I think as pretty dim-witted. Um the idol 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 um part and then the 
when Buddy says ideal, she avers, at least the way that I've I've seen this done uh, is I feel like Sally's saying, you know, you deal instead of ideal. Um, but then mm. avers like she doesn't understand what that word means or what the, yes. how that fits. And, you know, even a fella she prefers and she's immediately thinking furs, furs, um, mm-hmm. that she seems very flighty. And uh, and I think that's interesting that here's Buddy in Buddy's mind. She is the you know, she is his ideal. And even so, she's not the not the sharpest crayon in the box. Yeah, it's like almost like this song, because we're entering into Buddy's mind. These are maybe these deep seated beliefs or thoughts that he has. That he really tries to tamp down a lot. Uh, he mm-hmm. probably would never say out loud is like you're shallow or like you're dumb. But this is really definitely bringing that into there. Just as a quick aside, the only reason I know what a verse mean is because I watched The Wizard of Oz so much when I was a kid. <laughs> As cold runner, I must have her. I thoroughly examined her. What does that mean? So I had to look it up in the dictionary when I was like eight and like figure it out. So that's what you can learn about me, Kyle Marshall, in the year 2020. Um, I would like to talk just a quick little moment about how we enter into this scene because... Uh, there's two very drastically different ways that the actors we're talking about have approached this. And in particular, David Healy from the 1987 version is like super aggressive. And when he enters into this, it's like Sally. Oh, Sally. Like he get, like really gets into it. Like he's almost like menacing towards her. Sally. <laughs> oh, Sally. And then you have like the Peter Forbes version and, and to a degree, the Gene Nelson version, the uh, the original Broadway cast and the 2017 version, where it's almost like a revelation. It's like, Sally, oh, Sally, like you're here. And like, I'm surprised that you're walking into this dream and stuff that I'm having. Sally. Oh, Sally. And again, it very much changes the tenor, I think, of this like short scene, whether it's like I'm aggressively attacking you and like throwing almost barbs at you rather than a conversation we're having that's um, kind of showcasing your 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 character a little bit more. I don't know if you have anything <laughs> to say to that at all. No, I, I mean, I think you're right in terms of the just the feel of those, you know, even with the same lines. Um, although, the, as you said, the the London, the 87 London production, there is a, a little bit of lyric change there. Yeah. I've seen the video of the Gene Nelson version um, but I've not seen video of either the National Theatre or the 87 production in London. The the one I, I think of in my mind is the Mandy Patinkin version from the mm. 85 concert. Concert, where, yeah. Where he's doing all three parts. He, when he sees Sally, Sally is in the arms of another man. And so I, 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 there's some anger there from him. And I wonder if that was, not having seen the 87 production, I wonder if that was part of what they were going for that was part of the mm-hmm. uh, part of the context for that that's a good call out yeah I, i'm also not 100 percent on how it was staged in the 1987 mm-hmm. version uh, i have seen the 2017 version and from what i remember that's not true uh so that could be if we're seeing actually sally in the arms of another man on stage at that point then okay mm-hmm. it makes sense to kind of change a little bit about how you perform this song well and especially because all of what sally is saying Uh, Sally's saying sort of two things here. One, she does not like Buddy. And two, there is this other guy that she loves. In real life, is that Ben, whom clearly she's not in the arms of uh, for very long? Or is there yet another guy who's not Buddy that Sally likes? Right. Um, You know, but that that for Buddy, that's that's how he sees Sally is she's she is totally wrapped up, at least emotionally, if not also physically. Uh, with another man you know you also mentioned there about the mandy patinkin version um, of him performing all the parts and what really struck me here recently and again this is because of the 90th birthday celebration and um i always forget is it alex gemignani it's is the alex, younger yeah it's yeah, okay. alex yeah so alex gemignani did the performance of this song and f- immediately i'm like oh this is very close to franklin shepherd inc from earlier roll on in just that like there's a lot of acting you can do in this and mm-hmm. sometimes over the top, but it actually makes it better if you do like <laughs> different voices and like um, can perform it all as one person. It, mm-hmm. it literally makes you look like you're going insane as you keep going through this song. Yeah. And I, I wonder 
Yeah, I I liked his per, his performance of that a lot. Plus the choreography that he was doing was you know really on point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Everything uh, should be formed yeah. sitting down is what we're saying. Exactly. I wonder what that would look like in a staged production. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, when it isn't a concert or a uh, a quarantined birthday celebration. You know that. Would that work as well as the conceit of having him be the traveling salesman running around in a car on mm-hmm. stage? But yeah, it definitely does communicate that somebody having a mental breakdown in front of you. And like you said, I hadn't thought about the connection to Franklin Shepard Inc., but that totally parallels that. Uh, well, we get into the home stretch here. And so uh, Buddy continues on saying, I've got those. God, why don't you love me? Oh, you do. I'll see you later, blues. That long as you ignore me you're the only thing that matters feeling that if i'm good enough for you you're not good enough and thank you for the present but what's wrong with it stuff those don't come any closer because you know how much i love you feelings those if you will then i can't if you don't then i gotta give it to me i don't want it if you won't i gotta have it high low wrong right yes no black white god why don't you love me oh you do i'll see you later blues You ignore me, you're the only thing that matters. Feeling. Feeling. If I'm good enough for you, you're not good enough. No. And thank you for the present, but what's wrong with it stuff? No. Those don't come any closer, cause you know how much I love you. Feeling. That if you will, then I can't. If you don't, then I gotta give it to me. I don't want it. If you won't, I gotta have it. I love wrong, right? Yes, no, right, right. So why don't you Kiss love me? Oh, you do. I'll see you later. Once again, I have to say, I didn't make any mistakes in those. That was completely the first time. <laughs> I really love how this song ends. And it's such a shame that the original Broadway cast does not include this final section. Mm-hmm. Um, because it, it kind of crescendos to this point where it's like everything is topsy-turvy, like cats and dogs in the streets, you know, that sort of mentality. But I want to know from you first, David, what is it that uh, you uh, want to call out here first? So the... You know, most of that section is a is a repetition of what we've seen before, and you know maybe that maybe it's colored a little bit differently because we've now seen these two little scenes with the chorus girl Margie's and and Sally's. But the it's that last section, if you will, then I can't. If you don't, then I gotta give it to me. I don't want it. If you won't, I gotta have it. High, low, wrong, right, yes, no, black, white. That where this has maybe been a little bit light and bouncy and fun, even as he's having a mental breakdown. I think here it's it opens him up even more that it's not just he's torn between the woman he loves who doesn't love him back and the woman he's with who whom he doesn't care that much about it's just everything about his life is is being pulled apart high low wrong right and um that there's just a, a desperation there um that goes beyond I'm I I've screwed up my love life in this important way um, it's I've screwed up my whole life in some ways, and I can't reconcile that within myself. Yeah, and I, I also love the fact that this this last section is really begun as if it's like this is like the final big finish number sort of thing. Like mm-hmm. uh, it's almost like the you know the animated frog from Warner Brothers. Like <laughs> we're getting our top hat, top hat, and cane out to and uh, you know dance across the stage. Um, again, I will say, especially in the 2017 version where he almost puts that a little um, uh, juice onto his lyrics where it sounds very old timey. It's like as we start this off. But I think it, yeah, it gets to this really fun point at, at the very end of like, OK, so this is not just a fun throwaway song, which you could be led to believe that this song is It's like, oh, it's, you know, he's he's doing this performance, especially because Buddy is usually cast as. I'll kind of say like the dad, almost like your prototypical dad looking guy mm-hmm. where it's like, oh, you know, he can actually sing. He can actually perform. And there's more emotion to him than what he's even led on through a lot of this show. And it kind of just all comes to a head. So it's like, oh, this like funny little song ends in this like very tragic place, which is a great way to kind of characterize follies in a nutshell. <laughs> Starts off fun and light and it's like it gets very dark by the end. Yeah, absolutely. Um so overall, David, what what do you think? How how would you rate this song um as far as the rest of the score? Like where does it fall for you? I I really like this song a lot. I think it does a really nice job of 
of setting the stage for these follies numbers of balancing humor and horror um at at the character and and his life and it there's so much that it communicates without you know beyond just the text i think it's interesting and we talked about this a little bit that because this is the first of those follies numbers mm-hmm. um i think it has to do a lot of work and i at some point whether it was sondheim or or james goldman or hal prince had to decide what's the order for these four going to be right because it's it's clearly not a it's not a chronological piece of the plot and i think it's interesting that buddy starts because he was not ever in the follies you know he's in it, he's not like sally and phyllis where if right. we say when we see their number we might think oh this is this was their follies number you know the same way that broadway baby or i'm still here was for uh for characters earlier in the show um and so this is this is him going beyond he's not just a 20 year old kid singing this this is him very clearly in in the middle of his life and it probably for the first time explicitly in the show connects the two big meanings of follies the the performance style of the Ziegfeld or the Weissman follies with follies as a generic term for the the failings and and foibles of humans so when he says hello folks we're into the follies it's hey now we're going to see all of the all of the craziness of of these characters and all of our shortcomings and all of the ways that we've screwed things up and all of our brokenness um and i think he does a a really i think the song does a really good job of exposing buddy and and making him vulnerable for us that's a good way to wrap up um do you have a favorite recording of this song i am partial to that that mandy patinkin version um Mm -hmm. and i i really like the the danny burstein version in the 2011 broadway revival right of the three that we've been listening to i think the the 2017 uh production is really uh is really wonderful for that that crescendo that build at the end that you were talking about uh, the the only thing about that recording that it doesn't totally do it for me is at the beginning i feel like he doesn't have quite as much of the the old timey what is it that mid-atlantic accent uh right. for the yeah. vaudeville style that uh that we get on like the gene nelson recording mm-hmm to to give you that sense of we're in we're in old-timey vaudeville uh land here but i think the emotional intensity that that builds to is really uh is really powerful yeah i'm i'm right there with you uh like i said at uh, earlier on i'm just disappointed as is on time that the original broadway cast is so cut up the way it is because Mm -hmm. i think there's some really beautiful performances on there that are not given their due justice which is unfortunate um But yeah, I'm I'm normally an original Broadway cast guy. And for whatever reason, the 2017 version does a lot of great things that I'm a a big fan of. I find myself listening to that more and more than any other version for for whatever reason. But David, thank you so much for being here with me today. It's always great to chat with you. Um, Likewise. Thank you. I think I asked you this last time. We'll see if anything has changed. But if is there a way for people to follow you online if they wanted to? I mean, I, I'm on Facebook sort of nominally, uh, but uh, but I, I don't know that you'll find much there of interest uh, for folks. But uh, but for the most part, no, my uh, my social media footprint is pretty light. Honestly, that's probably the correct choice in these times. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, all right, David, thank you once again. Well, thank you, Kyle. Thank you so much for listening. You can send emails to puttingittogetherpodcast at gmail.com. You can also follow Sondheim Podcast on Twitter and Instagram. And you can support the show on Patreon by going to patreon.com slash puttingittogetherpodcast. Thank you to the Alberta Podcast Network, to Yeg Podfest, and to CPA Alberta this week. Putting It Together is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and pretty much anywhere you can get podcasts from. Consider subscribing so that you never miss an episode. Next week, we'll be talking about losing my mind, both the song and my state of being. As always, a big thanks to the great Chris Taniguchi, who designed the podcast artwork, and to Nick Driscoll for composing our theme music. Well, we've reached the end of our episode. Yes, I know. Goodbye for now. Yes!
Snow, Black, White. Tell me that you love me, or you're dead. I'll see you later.